uh, specially created for people who for whom it's probably uh, first at the conference but even even uh, otherwise you might have some questions and we can definitely try and answer this we have a really uh, very distinguished panel today to answer all the questions so today we have uh, stan gail james deb john and steve uh, i i'm going to let them uh, introduce themselves rather than me telling as a some incomplete um, role in their in the in the tadwick um, organization uh, before that uh, a few quick um, uh, housekeeping things um, uh, first of all we are really grateful for the tech support from the university of uh, florida conference team it has been really good experience uh, for me at least it has been really seamless experience so thank you all for answering our questions and making sure things are working the way they should this session will be uh, recorded for uh, later viewing uh, uh, please speak slowly and clearly especially for panelists uh, keeping in mind our uh, international attendees Mm -hmm. please uh, ask all your uh, questions for the speakers uh, to start with in the uh, q and a function in uh, whoa if if you really think so we can let you uh, like we can uh, let people unmute their mics and uh, ask the question in in person but let's start with the question and answer feature so that we know how many questions are coming in uh, regarding the chats there are two chats available so um, uh, as much as possible use the who are chat so that that is kind of saved for uh, later so there are any um, um, urls or anything like that it's it, it stays on rather than disappearing after the zoom session is closed and um, it, it's uh, let, let us use the chat function for technical questions and Uh, conversation so uh, you use it uh, judiciously and uh, remember any uh, inappropriate use of chat may uh, result um, in you being removed from the session or disabling the chat function uh, please read a, a code of conduct if you have not already and uh, uh, please bear with us if we face any uh, technical difficulties uh, hopefully we will not so far it has been really smooth so i think uh, let us uh, go ahead and get uh, started so as promised i think i will invite john first to uh, quickly introduce himself I good idea while well, i still have connectivity right <laughs> i'm john vitorek i'm the convener of the darwin core maintenance group uh and i go I'm involved in a myriad of other task groups that are somehow related to Darwin Core to try to help out there with my knowledge of Darwin Core and its history and how it works in practice. Thank you, uh, Stan. Would you please go next? Um, I'm Stan Bloom. Um, I'm currently in the role of a sort of administrator of the Secretariat at Tadwig. Um, so I have been helping a lot with the website and setting up the GitHub repositories and mailing lists and things like that. Um, I've been involved with Tadwig for hmm, more than 20 years now. Um, and, um, yeah, I've been, been through a lot. So if you have sort of history questions, I'm, I'm definitely a source. Thank you. Uh, Gail. Hi, I'm Gail Kampmeyer. Um, as far as Tadwig goes, I've been involved actually since 1996, probably older than some people who are on here. Um, and I was one of the first zoologists to become involved because it was started by a bunch of botanists and, and people interested in data science. Um, I'm editor in chief of the Biodiversity Information Science and Standards where our proceedings are being published, where all of the, you who submitted abstracts um, have published abstracts now. And I'm also on the program and steering committee for uh, this meeting. 
Thank you. Uh, Steve? Yeah, hi, I'm Steve Vaskoff. I'm the convener of the Audubon Core Maintenance Group, and I'm also serving on the Darwin Core Maintenance Group. I've been involved in Tadwig for a little over 10 years and have been in a bunch of different roles from review manager, author, et cetera. Um, key to this particular thing, I'm the, I was the lead author on the vocabulary maintenance specification. And so I've been involved in a lot of building a lot of the plumbing, if you wanna call it, of how we move things through the standards process and get them online and stuff like that. So if I were to describe my role, I'm the informal Tadwig plumber. <laughs> That's really nice. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> James? Hi, I'm uh, James Macklin. Now I'm trying to figure out, you know, what, what is my persona in all of this, but uh, I'll think of that while I talk. Um, so uh, I've been involved in Tadwig for about, say, 20 years, um, and uh, I've been in various roles uh, throughout, uh, including on the executive for, for a long period of time. Most recently, uh, as some of you know, I was the chair of Tadwig until uh, Dead took over. And uh, now I serve a, a new role as the co-chair with Nikki Nicholson of uh, the TAG, the Technical Architecture Group, uh, which you'll hear a little bit more about uh, if you attend our uh, sessions in November. So I think that's enough for me. Thank you, uh, Deb. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, and it's a, a privilege and an honor to be here as uh, elected chair of, of Tadwig. I come from the biodiversity informatics community uh, via early cutting my teeth on projects like MorphBank and learning about data standards. And the first one I had anything to do with was peripherally was with Audubon Core. Um, I'm currently biodiversity informatics community liaison uh, for the species file group. And one of my uh, things I like the best being a connector between, between communities and in that role serving uh, very much the way I like to serve at a, a larger level as well as this connecting organizations and communities and projects as well as connecting between things like uh, software development and software developers and the people who need those tools and services. Um, formerly, I was at IDIG Bio as the Workforce and Digitization Capacity Development Manager. So again, worked in this sort of uh, connecting role and uh, empowering our communities where I can. Some Experience so far with development of standards beyond Audubon Core include work on the collections description standard, which is ongoing right now, um, and the development of standards for managing people data, and one of the originators of Darwin Core Hour. And I too have to think about the connector idea, so analogous to plumber. Yes. Thank you very much, VJ, for uh, this session. Yeah. Thank you so much. So I think we will open the floor for questions. I don't see any, but I have one question for some time. It's probably for more for John and Steve. Uh, just just a, uh, how much time does it take from conceptualizing a new term to really get it into as a standard and kind of ready for use? I mean, I know it, it might vary a lot, but in general, what kind of timeline are we looking at? Wow. The timeline as opposed to how much of our time, I suppose, is the question. I won't answer the latter. Um, from experience with Darwin Core, most recently, we sort of began the motion to get a whole bunch of new and uh, requested change changes for terms in process in February of this year. The entire process, the finished review and the ratification of those that passed the review process happened in the middle of July. So it was basically half of a year in this case, but it was a special case because we had more than 40 terms to deal with in that period. And the review took double the normal 30 days because there were still a lot of open issues. Um, still, it's not an unreasonable expectation that maybe there could be two cycles of updates per year, given the amount of work and the amount of review that it takes. 
So I guess my answer would be, it depends on the complexity of the proposal. So we, in Audubon Core, we um, were trying to figure out how to um, model and create terms for regions of interest. And we started on that in probably March and finished the uh, public review in I think maybe August, and then it recently was approved by the executive. So that was on the scale of maybe six months. On the other hand, in some cases where it's um, more complex and we have a task group working on things like the um, views controlled vocabulary task group has been working for two years and we're still not done because we have to basically figure out how to make the terms work. On the other hand, we've had just think little fixes of stuff that wasn't clear clarifications that can fly right through in a couple months. Okay, so yeah, that's that's a fair idea of how, how things move. Uh, I still don't see any questions. So I'm surprised in the group of 84 participants, only one person who's first time for Tadwick. So it looks like everyone is a seasoned Chadwick or Chadwicker or whatever we call it. And <laughs> people don't seem to have too many questions. Uh, so any, any? I have one. Um, yeah. if, if this is not your first Tadwig meeting and you're here, what was your first one? Can you put the year in the chat? If you're only in Zoom, just please go ahead and put it in Zoom. But if you're in Whova, put the year that you first attended your very first Tadwig. Please and thank you. So there's lots of you here. You should have something like 80 answers pop up. Cool, so. Arthur has me beat. Uh oh. <laughs> Cause he's a botanist. Thank you, everybody, for sharing that. That really helps us get an idea of mm -hmm. who's, who's listening. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and please don't be shy. We have all of us here. I think we can all think of questions, too, but we really would like to hear from you. Ah, Carlos has questions. Yes, Carlos. You're like please. me, Carlos. You think you always have a question. Go <laughs> Vijay. Yeah. Um, I well, I have many questions, but I just was ask one, and then other people ask. Uh, Thank you. What is <laughs> thanks? What is the current status, if there is a status at all, of the taxonomic concept schema? Because we keep using it in scratch pads, it's built in. I I can maybe give an answer to that. So there's a a. Uh, chartered task group that Niels Klazenga is running of, to create tax on concepts schema 2.0. And that group has been meeting for at least a year. Um, they've got a lot of uh, uh, draft terms already in the issue tracker. So there's a lot of, uh, that's well underway. And I don't know what Niels's timeline is for that, but um, I would guess he's hoping to finish it within in the next year. Yeah, I think um, first draft might be out in early 2022, um, but I think it will take you know quite a, a few more months beyond that for discussion. Taxonomy always uh, you know provokes a tremendous amount of discussion, um, but I think it's going to be um, you know fairly well thought out and, and, and hopefully very usable. So we'll see. I think um, first tests and implementation might be with some of the, um, um, you know, some of the major uh, aggregators of taxonomic names, you know, the taxonomic backbone, for example, of, uh, of GDIF and, you know, some of the folks that are, um, you know, working on that. To see, in fact, in fact, it, it represents their data well and and makes things easier. 
So actually, I would just throw in one other comment about this, and that it relates to sort of the structure of Tadwig vocabularies, or at least the existing ones, which is that they're built on what we call the bag of terms layer, which is just um, terms that that don't have a lot of semantics attached to them. They just we try to have very clear definitions. And then sometimes people try to build things on top of that. So for example, TCS 1.0 is an XML schema. So it has a lot of structure and semantics built into that. So whether T so my guess is that TCS2 will start out at the bag of terms layer, but then the trickier part is building the, the semantic layer on top of that. And that may happen in like a second stage. And if I can build in there and generalize a bit, I mean, Carlos is asking this question because he legitimately wants to know, and what if it's not during the Tadwood conference? How would he find out, you ask? Well, uh, if you follow the pages of the task groups on our website, you'll see that some of the resources are there, like our GitHub repositories. Each one has a GitHub repository. Some of them have wikis that are active or not so active. Others have other kinds of documentation. But if you go to those places, you can look at the activity. You can see the issues that are being spawned. Of course, you can contribute to them. But uh, that's one way that uh, we, we try to keep the rest of, uh, of interested people up to date. And I think we're also, you know, Deb would agree that we're in this curious stage of sort of wanting to do a little bit better there and, and figure out other ways that we could communicate and keep people up to date with the progress that's being made. Uh, so ideas welcome. Yes, we have lots of conversations. Uh, we're trying to do similar to like Darwin Core Hour, Tadwig Hour, four times a year um, to take up topics, but we're always interested to hear how we can do more to connect communities and make sure that the relevant parties are engaged and informed where they need to be and want to be. Um, and, and please be a part of that with us. Uh, it's definitely a team effort. We if sometime could do a whole discussion about how it takes, how much it takes to produce a Darwin Core Hour. It's not minimal. We do have, I think, one or two sessions next month on, on the of the taxonomy group, right? So that probably will be a good place to start getting involved. Well, we have the working group and interest group sessions coming up in November. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Wednesdays and Thursdays in November. And so those are a great place to jump into one of those groups and um, get a real background in what they're working on and how you might potentially get involved. Okay, so have, we have one question. How many newcomers have you seen over the years? And are we doing better each year or not? Cool, that's a good question. Um, depends on how you measure newcomers. And I think maybe Stan might have some background or if William can join us with numbers. I can say that, for example, last year when it was free, we did a lot of work, but we didn't charge. Um, I can tell you, we had a lot of, extra people because attending was free. But I can say this year uh, with subsidizing the cost for students and postdocs, et cetera, the, the, the attendance by that particular group is just fa fabulous. Yes, exactly. But um, I think the questioner might be asking like, is it sustained engagement of a particular person? Is that what you're asking? Uh, I don't know. Paula, can you unmute and oh. ask a question? William did add a comment. These latest years, we've had the biggest, a bigger number of first timers. So certainly going virtual mm -hmm. has made that number go up. That's great. Um, the, uh, tied with that, do you, do you see over the years from, with the history of Tadwig, do you see that aside from the number of people that we're widening the audience, geographically speaking, I, are we really including more the South, for instance? It's a great question, Paula. Well, one time in a meeting or long term, I think is what you're asking. I think we have work to do for sure. Um, other people have thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I, I just want to say I think things are um, ha have been changing pretty rapidly over the last five years um, for the 
you know, 15 years before that, since like maybe 2002 or three, um, I plotted attendance at Tidewig meetings um, and, you know, showed how many people have, um, you know, come to, you know, wh which meetings they attended, right? So it's like mm -hmm. virtually every pe person that ever came to a Tidewig meeting did a big union of all that data. And there was definitely a core group. There was maybe like 50 to 80 people that have been, you know, whenever they join, they've been, you know, on for the long term. And then there was a lot of um, in and out where somebody would come for one meeting or maybe two meetings and then they would disappear. Some of those people have, you know, maybe technical roles within an institution and then they move on to something else and they're not really, they weren't really part of the biodiversity informatics community. Um, so there, but, but I think things are changing quite a bit. We've seen some of our largest numbers over the last four years, um, you know, where we've been regularly over, you know, 300, 400 people, you know, some of them attending, like um, our biggest physical meeting was, was in, at, in, in Leiden with uh, 700 people, you know, it was amazing. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the statistics for, you know, those people who they were, and because that meeting was, was hosted by a, um, you know, a different organization. And, so, you know, we were just part of that. We didn't so get Paula, the data. Oops, sorry, Sam. So, so Paula, just, just really two points real quick. I see, I'm looking at the list, which will put together nicely for the business meeting. For this year, I see Ecuador, the Dominican Republic, um, hold on one second, Brazil, Bolivia, um, so about, I can't tell here exactly if that's about 12 or 15 people from those parts of the world. But again, I'm looking through a big list, so it's hard to do in my, yeah. Um, there are other so-called Southern hemisphere places that I'm not, not naming that are definitely in this list. Um, I think the bigger question here too is how to do this. So one of my concerns, like we have these regional representatives of which you are one, right? So GBIF is talking about sort of upping this notion of the way it does regional regional help. And I made the point to Roland Roberts and looking for a model that helps us um, sort of build local capacity because the worlds of spinach, the worlds of Tadwig and the worlds of GBIF all begin to overlap. And we have this same sort of, where we get back to the same group of people in each one of those nodes. And, and all of a sudden that person's wearing three hats. Um, so there's something to manage there. That's both an advantage and the, yeah, there you go. Right, so, but it, but again, do we, do we, who is that? Is that you who said it? I gotta, yeah, scroll up, sorry. So Paula there, but would we do that separate from GBIF? Or would we do it in a, aligned with GBIF? Well, that's a difficult question, Deb. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I think there are there are places where we can converge and others where it won't be as easy. But we can definitely take advantage of commonalities and definitely not duplicate efforts. Yes. <laughs> you, know? you can see in my mind, I know that spinach has for years and is trying to do, has talked about the same thing setting up things like regional spinach nodes and regional spinach meetings. And I start thinking, well, if I reach out to Ecuador, I'm gonna reach out to Claudia Segovia because I know her and should it. And oh, if I'm in Tadwig, I'm gonna reach out to Claudia Segovia. And oh, if GBIF asks me, who can I contact in Ecuador? I'm gonna say Claudia Segovia. And now all of a sudden, this same person is being pinged by three different communities, overlapping needs, right? Overlapping, but there's, so having some care there so that we think about exactly what you just said with, how can we take advantage of that without <clears throat> noting that we continue to have this pretty very small community in reality? Okay, so there are a few questions now. Uh, There's one question. Uh, has there been any development of the Apple Core herbarium based standards in the past few years? Is there still any interest in developing this? <laughs> well, I guess that's me. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the real answer to that is no. Uh, it got off to a running start. Uh, we stabilized a bit. We moved platforms at least two or three times. 
Uh, and I'd love to do more. Um, I'd love to come back to that uh, because I think it's really important to have the sort of domain definitions and interpretations uh, based off of our important standards. So, uh, well, call it a rally call. Uh, if, if people are interested, I, I would try to dive back in and, and help organize. And I'd encourage other communities to do the same. Uh, so the idea behind Apple Corps, as I sort of just said, is it was a bunch of herbarium people getting together and saying, well, this Darwin Core thing, if we want to exchange botany, you know, like stuff, what would we put in this field? Or, you know, how would we, how would we deal with things like life stage and things that need controlled vocabularies, uh, which both Paula and Steve have spent both a bunch of time on, you know? So there's all these questions and we started, but uh, all domains need to do this in a way. James, is Apple going to come after you for Apple Core? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> How about I... Malice Core? <laughs> malice towards none? Actually, the attribution goes to Amanda Neal for that. She started it. She for would. Apple Core or, yeah. Apple Core, the name. Mm. Um, before I forget, so it gets recorded for posterity, going back to your query, Paula, one of the thoughts that has come to mind before, and I'll say it again, we could benefit from setting up a formal meeting with, uh, with the Carpentries directory, the um, directors. And because I think for a variety of reasons, and yours is one of them, um, studying how they've managed to do um, this sort of worldwide network uh, we'd benefit from studying. And it does involve parallel structures to the kind of things GDF has done, but they haven't done it exactly the same way. Um, and they've much more use of things like GitHub to sort of democratize the, I think, the access to materials and the development of materials so that they can be things like forked into different languages and things like that. That's a, that's a regular part of, of the carpentries and how they do business. Okay, so there are a couple of questions about the format of future Tadwigs. Do you think it would be possible to have face-to-face -face meeting with some sessions also virtual? The best of both worlds is one question from Arthur Chapman. And then is also another question. Any thoughts on how future Tadwig meetings will run, virtual or in person or both? I mean, I'll be happy to take that. Anybody else want to have a chance at the microphone? Okay. I mean, I will say that if I'm reading the tea leaves, hybrid is probably the way most meetings in the future are going to go. Um, as much as people want to meet in person, there are still people, and Arthur, I don't know if you're one of them. I think it was, y'all remind me, was it Ellie who said, I think in Australia, you'll have to correct me if I'm getting this wrong. Um, Ellie said right now, I think if they travel internationally, they come back, they have to do a two week quarantine. And so no one's gonna be willing to pay for that. So they couldn't get permission to travel to a meeting now if they wanted to. And, and so they would automatically be left out if we have a meeting that doesn't have a virtual component. Um, they are the most expensive type of meeting. So the cost is something to think about there and the fundraising that might need to be done and how to continue providing that access. So if you're going to have a local meeting, right, you still have the hotels and the food, et cetera. Um, all that has to be done on top of the virtual platforms and the people needed to help uh, make that a reality. But I think to me, in, in Europe, they have their vaccine passports. They have their system set up. They're going to travel fairly freely, I believe, inside Europe. Uh, but the rest of us around the world, are, are still having these, these different constraints and these added added barriers. Arthur, I know that's not a direct answer. Anybody wanna add extra? Well, next year, we'll talk about uh, what happens in 2022. We're hoping to meet in person. And I think um, the, the ability to reach people who can't travel um, whether it's because of COVID or whether it's just because of money um, or, you know, local commitments, whatever, um, you know, the, the, the hybrid model is probably going to be with us for a, a good long while, if not forever. 
Um, we're definitely going to be, you know, we've been trying to put our talks up, or at least some of them, um, to record them and to have the videos available. Um, time zones is always a challenge. Um, so that's one of the solutions that, you know, has helped both in terms of not being able to be there in, in, a, in the right time zone or not being able to be there in, in person, um, you know, to get, get across that barrier. Um, we've noticed uh, certainly that, um, you know, a lot more people have been able to join this meeting because of, um, you know, the, the, the getting there and the registration fee is much, much less, if not waived. Yeah, I would just like to encourage us to, you know, we, I think everybody has learned a lot through the pandemic about what's possible to do remotely. And even if we don't have a fully hybrid meeting, just offering the opportunity for people to participate remotely um, through giving presentations or participating in like the, the task group and interest group meetings, I think is really important. Speaking as a person whose first five years of involvement in Tadwick, I had no funding to attend international meetings. There were years when I was heavily involved in work and yet was not able to participate in the meetings because I didn't have money to fly somewhere. So I hope that we can use what we've learned from how to um, facilitate remote participation to make it possible for people to participate even if we don't do a fully hybrid meeting. Um, th thanks, Steve. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> I wanna add a comment to being transparent about funding and what we're paying for. Um, David Fichtmuller writes an important note about Tadwig and Costa Rica and a hybrid meeting and streams remotely. But David, if memory serves, and y'all again, correct me, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was subsidized by IDIG Mayo money. So that was using the Adobe Connect uh, contract from IDIG Bio, by, used by Tadwig to fund that. So somebody was paying for our ability to do that. Right. So so it wasn't free in that sense. Right. And and so keeping keeping that in mind about understanding sort of really what it is you're getting and what we're paying for this um, time zone issue we've always had. So even when we've had in person meetings, we have a time zone issue, which is to say, if you can't travel to the meeting like date, like Steve just said, um, if you can go remotely, and it's in the middle of the night. That's your choice. Right. We have people at this meeting I know of who've completely flipped their um, calendar, their awake and sleep time so they could attend. We purposely chose, because the University of Florida is hosting and they are managing this conference, we chose that 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. window. Um, that's both practical consideration and a financial consideration, right? One quick question, are there dates and location for 2020 already out? 2022? Yeah, 2022. Yeah, we'll announce it on, <laughs> on, on Friday at the business meeting. Yes, so it's, uh, the announcement usually comes on the last day, right? Uh-huh. I will tease you and say it's in Europe. <laughs> uh, there is one more question. Uh, what is one thing Tadwig has learned after 10 or 15 years? That it's really hard to produce standards. <laughs> Other thoughts? It's even harder to maintain them. Okay. I would just like to give kudos to people like Gail who work behind the scenes to make the conference work. I remember the first conference I went to at Woods Hole, it wasn't even clear whether I was giving a presentation or not by the time I got there. And the, the infrastructure for, um, for managing the talks and the sessions in you know, 10 or 12 years is just an order of magnitude better than it was at that time. So kudos to all the hardworking people who've made that happen. Practice. <laughs> yeah, things get refined each year.
<laughs> yeah, I mean, so, you know, if in all kinds of work, um, communication amongst a lot of people um, takes time, takes effort. Um, if you want to just put your own thoughts out there, it's very easy. If you and a couple other people want to get those out there, um, you know, that's a little bit harder, but maybe not so much. Um, when you get 20, 30, 100 people commenting on something, um, you know, it, it can take a lot of effort. So that's, that's why things tend to take so long, I think. Um, but that's, you know, that's the cost of, of developing consensus. I, I think, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think another thing, this is like a very technical thing, but we figured out how to use GitHub. Um, I, I don't see how we could have managed the complex number of issues that we had. It, it, despite the issues that people have with GitHub, when we didn't have GitHub, it was way worse in terms of trying to, and stuff got lost. I mean, literally, we have literally we have a lost standard that that uh, as far as I know we don't have a single copy of. So the ability to not lose things and to track things and so on, I think, is huge. Um, we're going to put that in the lost and found. Yeah, maybe you can put it in there. Yeah, actually, I will put it in there. I've been just asking old timers whether they have a copy of it on their hard drive somewhere, and so far, far I haven't found it. Which one is it? Um, let's see. I, give me a minute, and I will give you an answer to that. I think I think <laughs> it's going to require here. a visit to the Smithsonian or something. You know, um, <laughs> in the botany department library, there might be a copy of, of something. Um, I see a question in the chat. I mean, in the Puva. I want to go back to the one you asked, though, VJ, real quick. I noticed in the chat. And this is the Zoom chat. Sorry, y'all. I'm trying to follow two chats. Um, James makes the point we're all volunteers. Anna de Molin is making the point about um, this this challenge from, you know, access and this the people in countries where the most diversity are the ones with the least access. So making it accessible online. Carlos makes the point that online can be hard as well. Uh, we learned this when we were in Africa. We learned this in the carpentries. Just because you make something online doesn't mean someone can afford to do it. You see people paying uh, M-Pesa. They're going to get on their phone so they can go to the internet cafe in order to listen to a session or participate. So they really have to make an effort. Um, materials and how they're available and what formats they're available in, is a, it's a huge issue. I read something in Brazil. I wish I could remember her name. It will come to me. It starts with a C. Uh, she wrote a book recently. Um, something like in Brazil, something like half the people don't have access to like the iPhone kind of things. They don't, they don't have smartphone easy access to the web and information. And so the more our tools require those things to have access to that information, the more we're creating a divide. So when somebody said and asked that question about the future, I hope one of the things that we're continuing to do is not just the development of standards, but the adoption of the standards and the connection to the communities that are users of them so that we're building these bridges so that the output, the products that are created using those standards um, that there also is a connection, not just making the standard, putting it out there and saying you, you do the rest, right? But continuing to build these bridges. Um, there was a question in the- Yeah, the so uh, how, how does Chadwick align the work and recommendations between different interest groups? Ah, that's a tag question. Yeah, what am I supposed to say? It's kind of a free for all. Uh... <laughs> Alignment is a, is a very, uh, is a generalization. I mean, I think most people who have watched standards process over the years have seen it come through enthusiasm, kind of like what I hinted to in the chat of projects, right? Somebody gets a project, has a need for something, and that drives a community, possibly a task group, possibly even an interest group uh, to form in order to start to address it. Uh, and, and that's the momentum. But of course, those things come and go, they wane as we know. Uh, and so some things carry on because you know the community embraces it and there's enough volunteerism to keep it alive. 
Other times it's a very punctuated event uh, and it stops. And, and Stan wants to say more. Yeah, I just want to say it's not just tag. Tag is more about how to uh, mechanically create the alignments or to work in some sort of way like that. But it's also the executive with every charter that comes through and is, is reviewed, the executive um, tries to have an overview of everything that's going on. And it's their job to make sure that people are working together that need to be. Um, and we try to do our best. Um, and we make the recommendation, you know, you need to have a liaison between this group and that group. And, and, and we try, but, you know, obviously there are gaps because the other thing that Tadwig needs to do is, is to be, as Lee Belbin um, said 10 plus years ago, Tadwig needs, needs to be flexible in the face of initiative. So when people start to say, we need this and we're going to push to make this thing happen, we don't want to really shackle them with um, sort of historical ways that things have been done or, or sort of impediments like that. So, you know, we, we try to, you know, let people have, you know, sort of, you know, wouldn't say complete free reign. We're not, we're, it's not about chaos, but uh, like I said, flexibility in the face of initiative. Yeah, I'd just like to add on to what Stan said. Uh, the first couple of years I was in Tadwig, I was very intimidated and I participated in some conversations, but I was invited by, basically told by one of the Tadwig old timers, what Stan just said, which is, uh, we don't want to stand in the way of initiative. And the, the person basically said, why don't you form a task group and, or, or get involved in a task group and I did, and that was sort of the beginning of my involvement. So I, I think there is a welcoming of, of newcomers to the process. I, I certainly was welcomed. Um, I invited myself to the party, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next I, question. I did. oh, sorry. <laughs> you did, yeah, Stan? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't like what I saw. And, uh -huh. and so it was like, well, if you don't like what you see, then, you know, change it step forward and change it. So I had, I had strong opinions. That was about, you know, what kinds of standards need to be developed and how and how this worked. And, you know, we've been through a, a lot of navel gazing in Tadwig, uh, as we say, you know, to sort of look at our purpose and how we work and, and it has evolved and continues to evolve. Uh, constitution has been revised twice. Uh, process has been revised once plus uh, a number of sort of, you know, I wouldn't say minor tweaks, significant tweaks, but they're refining the way we work. Um, and, and again, I would second what, what Steve said about using GitHub um, and, and going from endless email threads into trying to focus on creating, um, you know, in essence, definition, solid work that people can, can you know, build on. Yeah, so you just reminded me too, in the future, I think the GitHub has been key and I see, and hopefully more use of things like Slack or Gitter, the kinds of things that could get at where Paula was going with a, another avenue yet, again, it requires connectivity, but this different way in which to allow people from all over the world in their particular time zones to engage, to have a conversation, to access expertise, to share their own um, in ways that are, to me, a lot greater than like the crazy email chains you're referring to. Um, we're almost out of time, VJ. I don't know how we want to handle that. We do uh, I think just one last question and then we can close. It's interesting question. What was the track record for developed standards so far in your opinion? What is a hit? What was a moderate success? What struggled? Does anyone want to talk about it? I'm thinking. Okay. Darwin Core rocks. Yes. That's all I got to go. say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was about to say that, John, for you. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to put in a plus. How many billion records in, in GBIF? Now? It's, it's over one. I don't know. I haven't looked recently. One point here. <laughs> Nearly two. Yeah, approaching 2 billion, wow.
how how so, how do you segregate what is Darwin core and what is Audubon core in that? Right, Steve. Yeah, oh, I mean, I was just going to put in a, a plug for the little sibling of Darwin core, which is Audubon core, <laughs> which I think is um, a lot of people think of it as an extension to Darwin core, but with all of the camera trapping and things like that that are going on, um, I think media is really plays a huge role in uh, in the sort of modern biodiversity informatics. So I'm, I feel like um, Audubon cores come a long way from you know nothing to what it is right now. Um, I would add that right now, when, if you want to go see the use of the different standards and their extensions, GBIFIS does this lovely thing now where you can actually click to say, show me all the data sets that use Audubon core. Show me all the data sets that use whatever. So you can get a real time mm -hmm. <laughs> answer to that question, uh, at least as far as the GBIF repository goes. <laughs> um, Yes, I think we are at the end of our time. Uh, in question and answer, there was a very interesting question which is being answered by several people. I would just uh, uh, request all of you to <laughs> go look at it, the funny stories about Tadwig. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Stan, Steve, James, John, Deb, and Gail for uh, participating in this very interesting panel discussion. I'm pretty sure most of the questions are were answered and we can we can definitely keep uh, talking about it uh, during the conference on the conference platform as well as we are always there on GitHub and email. So we can always uh, keep the communication going, but I think this was a good condensed question answer session, which answered a lot of questions. And I learned a lot from, from this, even though I've been involved kind of for several years. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, VJ. Thank you. Thanks, VJ. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for your questions. See you in a few minutes. <laughs>